I'm Ian Golden, the director of the school, and we are all about interdisciplinary work on the great challenges of the world. And I'm delighted to have Tad Homer Dixon here today because he's also about interdisciplinary work on the great challenges of the world. Tad is an innovative thinker. He's uh, someone who has done many, many interesting things. Uh, he comes from currently from Waterloo in Canada. Where's that? In uh, uh, Waterloo is a, a really very interesting place amongst the many claims to fame. It's the base of uh, research in motion and uh, the activities that have been spawned uh, out of uh, what some of you might just think of as Blackberry. Uh, so Tad is going to talk about catastrophic dehumanization, the psychological dynamics of severe conflict. Um, pretty intense. He's well qualified as director of the Waterloo Institute for Complexity and Innovation, Wiki. Uh, we greatly look forward to collaborating with Tad uh, as we establish our complexity group within the Oxford Martin School. Felix Reed Soccer, Stone Farmer is coming and others uh, will be close collaborators, we hope, going forward with you, Tad. Uh, he's also the <coughs> professor in the School of Environment, Enterprise and Development and got cross appointments all across, uh, as far as I can see, uh, Waterloo. Uh, he's written many great books. I'd recommend two of them which I've read uh, to you. The one has this great title, The Upside of Down, um, so you won't forget that. Catastrophe, Creativity, and the Renewal of Civilization. And the other book which he's very well known for is The Ingenuity Gap, which is also tremendously well written and deeply stimulating. So, Tad, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Well, it's absolutely marvelous to be here. Uh, it really is terrific, especially at such a beautiful time of year. Uh, it seems I come to Oxford to present my craziest ideas. So, uh, I have to warn you that uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, provisional and speculative, in some ways stylized and a bit artificial. Uh, but I've been encouraged by colleagues back in Waterloo to to develop this idea further. And one of the things I like about this community in particular is I always get just terrifically good feedback on these ideas, which helps advance them further. And before I go any further, I should know exactly how much time I've got. Uh, let's say 40 minutes. 40 minutes? Max, is that all right? OK, and we have to be out of here. 5.30. 5.30, OK. So I'll aim to finish by about a quarter to. So I'm going to have to run along pretty quickly on this. Uh, uh, Ian and I were just in Berlin at the uh, third conference of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. And Ian, I don't know if you were struck by, uh, by something at that conference. Uh, it's a conference that is trying to introduce new thinking, new ideas into, into economics, to break out of the mold of conventionality. Uh, and a particular concern of the folks there was the current economic crisis in Europe. Uh, and there was a, a palpable sense of uh, the potential risks associated with that economic crisis. But nobody <laughs> mentioned the fact that the conference was happening in Berlin. And right behind the Adlon Hotel, where we were meeting, was a Holocaust memorial. Uh, and and one, one commentator I noticed, one panelist, uh, who was talking about the relationship between austerity programs and civil violence, said, you know, this is relevant to our location. The stormtroopers came through the Brandenburg Gate uh, and marched through that gate outside. But, but otherwise, people didn't make the historical connection. I don't know whether it was a particular sensitivity to the Germans, but actually the, the Germans have a pretty robust ego and can have a conversation about these things now. And it certainly is a very important example of what can happen of social disintegration and unraveling of the social compact and, and utterly, absolutely ultimately an absolutely horrific example of what I call catastrophic dehumanization. So while I was there, I hadn't been to Berlin before, I went to the Holocaust Museum. And I, uh, I, I would highly recommend it. It's an extraordinary place to those of you who haven't been there. Um, in many respects, it's difficult to talk about the Holocaust because it is sui generis. It was a unique event. Uh, and, but I would argue that the underlying 
uh, psychological and social psychological phenomena and mechanisms that were part of the Holocaust were not. Uh, now, I'm going to show a photograph from, from the information uh, pavilion in, in the Holocaust Memorial. It's actually called the Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe. This is a difficult photograph to see, but I, I want to start with this as a way of situating the issue that we're talking about. Uh, and uh, it was one that absolutely struck me and astonished me to my core. This is a photograph taken on 14th of October 1942 in Zolbunov, Zald Ukraine, Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. And you can see what's happening. The two soldiers there, uh, one of whom is methodically executing these women who have been uh, put on the ground, uh, stripped of their clothes and are lying face down. Um, I'm interested in what's happening or what happened in the heads of these individuals. Uh, what we see in this event is, is an example of phenomena that really aren't sui generis. Uh, in Rwanda, there were attacks with machetes. Hundreds of thousands of people were killed. In Nanking, in the Second World War, uh, the Japanese with bayonets against the Chinese. In My Lai, in the Vietnam War, with bullets. This psychological phenomenon is uh, obviously a key part of the conflict process. And I would even suggest that it's a, 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 a catastrophic dehumanization, I should say. I would say that it's it is a, 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 a necessary condition, not obviously a sufficient condition, but a necessary condition for severe conflict. Whereas I think that frequently the dehumanization is regarded as almost a consequence of severe conflict. I actually think it's in some respects a causal precursor. And so getting an understanding of it could be particularly useful and valuable. Now some people might say, well, you know, you have certain particularly uh, sociopathic or psychopathic individuals, certainly the uh, units that were brought in to carry out these executions in the Ukraine and Eastern Europe in the wake of the Barbarossa campaign, uh, SS units that people were specifically chosen. There was some probably selection process. But I think we know from a subsequent social psychological and psychological investigation, for instance, the Milgram experiments, the Stanford prison experiments, that uh, it's unfortunately true that not all of us, but most of us, have the capacity to behave in such horrific ways if the circumstances are appropriately organized. And that's a very interesting phenomenon that we need to understand better. And what I've tried to do in this work is get us a more accurate understanding of the underlying causal mechanisms involved. So what is my uh, dependent variable? Uh, well, in a, a reading of the literature that is by no means entirely complete yet, I would say that dehumanization involves uh, de-individuation of members of the other group. So you stop seeing them as individuals and you see the group is just a mass of people, undifferentiated, homogenized. Uh, an application of a highly pejorative caricature or stereotype, often involving an analogy to a machine or an animal, to the other group. Uh, and this is particularly important, the denial of the moral legitimacy of the other group's way of life, its interests, its actions, and even existence. Uh, and this concept of moral legitimacy, I think, is critically important, and I'll highlight it again in a moment. So dehumanization through these three phenomena, which may happen simultaneously, I don't think they're necessarily in the temporal order I put on the previous screen, renders the group's members as unlike us and critically puts them beyond the boundary of our moral community and thus beyond the range of our responsibility and care. And that makes it possible for us to do horrific things to them. Uh, it means fundamentally a loss of identification with members of the other group. Um, critically, it doesn't necessarily mean a loss of empathy. And this was something of an epiphany for me when I recognized this. Uh, 
if you think of empathy as the ability to put yourself in the shoes of the other, uh, I think you can lose identification with members of another group, which means you no longer regard their interests and goals and even existence as morally legitimate. But you can still empathize with them. And infrequently what we see in some of these most horrific acts of violence is the actual use of that empathy as a way of getting inside the heads of the other parties, the opponents, if you will, to understand what would hurt them the most. So you can inflict the most psychological terror or harm on them. And so if we didn't empathize with them, if the people who are engaged in these horrific acts didn't actually empathize with the people on the other side, they probably wouldn't treat them as horrifically or wouldn't be able to know how to treat them as horrifically as they ultimately do. In fact, one of the things that conflict theorists often remark on is that frequently human beings in these situations treat each other worse than they would ever treat a higher animal, say livestock or something like that, that they would ever consider treating uh, their, their farm animals. Uh, so why is that? Well, it's partly because you're so um, angry and possessed by anger against those individuals that you want to do them the most harm possible. And, and because you can, in a sense, empathize through your motor neurons, your mirror neurons, uh, with those individuals, uh, you can actually know how to hurt them the most. It can happen suddenly. I think this is uh, why it's a particular interest to me. Sometimes you can actually see the switch turn on and off. You've all heard about situations in serious conflicts where, you know, one week you have families that are intermingled across, say, an ethnic boundaries, for instance, in Sarajevo, and very shortly thereafter, the families are split and the people hate each other deeply. Uh, how many of you have actually ever felt road rage? Come on, let's get some more hands up. Well, there is a moment there. And you think about it, be honest with yourself. There's a moment there. All I can say is being a Canadian, this is why I'm glad we have gun control. Right? Uh, there's a moment where, where something happens. A switch gets thrown and, you, and, and, and you're in such rage that you would, uh, if you had the capability, and uh, possibly do serious damage to the other person, hurt them very severely. It's possible that this capacity, nonlinear capacity to dehumanize the other uh, has some value for reproductive fitness or had some value for reproductive fitness. And this is entirely speculative, but the story would go something like this. Um, as human beings developed a higher consciousness and uh, the capacity to empathize, the capacity uh, with mirror neurons to put themselves in other people's shoes, uh, to uh, create a sense of moral legitimacy within a community, uh, a sharing of understandings that provided social capital and allowed for problems to be solved effectively within the community, all of which is enormously useful in terms of creating complex societies and and uh, uh, solving the problems that hominids faced, um, it could potentially be very costly because you need to be able to shut it off fast. If the other guys were coming over the hill, the other tribes coming over the hill, you didn't want to say, oh, wow, you know, I think you guys are part of our, our moral community and I'd just like to talk with, with you for a while or something. And meanwhile, they, they're bringing their clubs and, and uh, could take all your resources away. So there needed to be a capacity to just turn it off turn off uh, the identification mechanism. And, uh, and those groups that were able to do that under a certain set of circumstances uh, would have um, had a reproductive advantage. Entirely speculative, but not, I don't think, implausible. So current scholarship provides some understanding of the types and social conditions under which dehumanization concern, can occur but it provides little understanding of its underlying psychological mechanisms. Now, just to give you a little bit of autobiography, uh, my original research field was conflict theory, going back to my undergraduate years over 30 years ago. Uh, and right from the beginning of my work on human conflict, this phenomenon of dehumanization is something that has always fascinated me because I thought that it was a, a perhaps a necessary condition for very serious conflict, that it had some kind of causal role. Uh, haven't been able to find an adequate explanation of the mechanism. Uh, but nonetheless, for a long period of time, especially before I went to the University of Waterloo, when I was at the University of Toronto, 
I taught uh, conflict theory. Uh, and uh, one of the results of that, I don't know what's on the next slide here. Um, I'll come back to that in a moment. One of the results of that was a, a pretty deep understanding of the existing literature on human conflict across many disciplines. Uh, and I start to see commonalities and patterns in some of the theories of conflict, uh, which ultimately resulted in the argument that I'm going to present in a minute. A catastrophe theory, uh, not widely employed in political science or uh, conflict research. There may be some people who are much more familiar with this body of work, especially the technical aspects, than I am. I come to this as a non-mathematician, uh, much more conceptual. I'm sort of back-ending the math into my model now instead of starting with it at the front end. Uh, that may or may not be uh, a smart way of approaching this problem. I'll explain that more in a minute. Nonetheless, I think that in the case of dehumanization, uh, it, it, catastrophe theory, um, originally developed by René Tom back in the, Felix helped me, 1970s, 60s and 70s, right? Uh, it, can, it can allow us to uh, see and understand phenomena or subphenomena in the overall phenomenon of cat catastrophic dehumanization that we wouldn't see otherwise. The sharp discontinuity sometimes occurs between states of identification and non-identification. The inaccessibility of intermodal values between these states, uh, you can't sort of half dehumanize somebody. You know, you either identify with them or you don't. The existence of uh, hysteresis in the pathways of change between these states, I'll explain that more in a moment. And the widening divergence under some circumstances between these states, which increases the size and severity of the discontinuity. And all of that will be a bit clearer in a moment. Now, that is the uh, uh, catastrophe surface that I'm proposing. And I said that I sort of, I've sort of back-ended the math into this. I haven't started with a set of equations. Instead, what I did is I, I, I started by identifying the dimensions of this space, this three-dimensional space. Uh, and, uh, and then I specified the individual hypotheses, and there are five of them, uh, that characterize, first of all, the intersections of this surface, which is called the response surface with the sides of the cube, and then uh, finally the fifth hypothesis, the position of this cusp here. And I'll walk through those hypotheses in the next few minutes. But first of all, I want to talk about the sides of the cube. I mentioned a moment ago that I'd, in my work in uh, conflict theory and teaching conflict, I'd started to see uh, patterns. And after 10 years of teaching conflict theory to undergraduates, I usually spent the last couple of weeks of the course, the year-long course, uh, highlighting three variables in particular, opportunity structure, uh, um, relative deprivation, and uh, identity. Opportunity structure, relative deprivation, and identity, each of which is embedded in a very large literature in conflict theory. Uh, relative deprivation is about sense of injustice. Opportunity structure is about the sense of agency that individuals have, and identity is about uh, people's perceptions of their own identity and other groups' identity, often very antagonistic in a highly conflictual environment. Um, and I'd, at the end of this course, I had put together a rough sort of product term, and I said, if you really want to understand conflict, you need to consider each one of these three variables uh, for any given conflict. And I left it at that. Uh, then when I, when I went to the University of Waterloo, I had a, I, I was very fortunate to have a very bright PhD student working with me, Manana Milkerite, who's actually going to be here in a few months. And uh, when she arrived, she wanted to know everything I knew about, conflict, about complexity theory. And I gave her a whole bunch of stuff. She went off and read it. And then because she was interested in working on uh, climate stress and conflict, she wanted to know everything I knew about conflict theory. So I gave her an enormous amount of stuff. She went off and read it, including all the notes from this course. Uh, and you scribbled over a period of almost 20 years, and she came back, and I said, you know, pay attention to these three variables. And uh, she came back and said, you know, you really should do something with this, because you don't see it anywhere else in the literature. So what I've done is I've taken these three variables, and I've used them to create the, uh, the state space for catastrophic dehumanization. So I'm going to just spend a bit of time on each one of these variables, because there are two, there are two intellectual moves here in this argument. One is, the, the first move is about, about the state space. 
It's about this three-dimensional space. And then there's a second move, which consists of those hypotheses I was mentioning before, which is about uh, what, what the shape of the surface is, is inside the state space. So let's first of all talk about identity. So this involves the perception of we, and also ultimately of they, varying, but there are really two factors here. Uh, there's a debate in social psychology about whether they should be separated or combined. Inclusive identity, which means that we're all part of the we, versus an exclusive identity, which means we're, the people in this room are part of the we, but those people out there are part of the they, okay? Uh, and inclusive identity uh, is generally one that is tolerant of all the individuals who are members of the we. And when you have an exclusive identity, not all exclusive identities are antagonistic. You can perceive a they, another group out there, what is called by social psychologists an outgroup, and not perceive them antagonistically. But at the bottom of this, this <coughs> continuum, the uh, e exclusive identity is highly antagonistic. As you move down the continuum, you, you move uh, from a, a tolerant to a more antagonistic position. I'll explain that. I have a little bit of writing here. It's important to get these definitions right. So identity refers to an individual's perception of the degree to which the surrounding population, the population surrounding him or her, is divided into an in-group and an out-group. And if the population is so divided, the degree to which the individual regards the out-group negatively it varies, as you've seen, between inclusive slash tolerant and exclusive slash antagonistic. I'm sorry for the text-heavy slides. There are a couple of them. Um, but I could say this, having it up on the screen, too, really helps lock it in. When you have an inclusive tolerant identity, it means the individual perceives the in-group boundary to encompass everyone in the population, as I said before. The reference for the we is the entire population. Remember, this is a very stylized model, so I'm thinking of sort of, you know, a population of 10,000 people, for example. And, uh, and the individual perceives no out-group or they and can easily identify with any member of that in-group, that population. When you have an exclusive or antagonistic identity, it means the individual perceives the population to be divided decisively in, in an in, into an in-group and an out-group. The individual has a severely negative perception of the out-group. He or she de-individuates and characters, char characters members of that group and does not regard them as participants in his or her moral community. This is dehumanization. Okay? So let's talk about justice, varying between unjust and just. Somewhat simpler definition. First, the individual's assessment of the justice of, of the justness of either the individual's own situation, the situation of others in the population with whom the individual identifies, and or the actions of others in the population towards the individual or towards people with whom the individual identifies. These are ethically salient situations or actions. All, all three of these things together are ethically salient situations or actions. And it varies between just and unjust. Now finally, in some respects, the variable that people would have outside of political science would have most trouble uh, grappling with is probably this one of structural constraint, but it is critically important. Uh, this is the perception of constraint on agency, on the capacity uh, to get one's way, latitude or elbow room for agency. Uh, those constraints, those structural constraints can be material or they can be social, they can be in the form of institutions or norms. They can be in the forms of walls like this. Excuse me. And so it refers to the degree to which members of the population perceive themselves and others to be restricted in their ability to exercise their agency. It varies between strong and weak. When it's strong, it means the individual perceives that the surrounding material and social structures provide members of the population very limited, if any, latitude for agency. And when it's weak, the individual perceives that these structures provide members of the population with wide latitude for agency. Now, I'm ass I assume that this is a homogenous across all members of the population. So as an individual, I'm looking out at the population. If I perceive myself to have a certain latitude for agency, I perceive everybody else to have the same latitude for agency. That's a simplifying assumption. It doesn't have to hold. I can modify this model in order to account for differential perceptions of differential agency or structural constraint in the system. Leave that aside for the time being. These are two very important points. Uh, structural constraint is inversely correlated with attributed responsibility for action. 
And you can see this in your own intuitions, right? As you perceive people have more latitude for decision making and agency in their own lives, uh, you perceive those people to be increasingly responsible for their actions, right? Seems straightforward. And it's also inversely correlated with perceived potential harm. As structural de constraint declines on those other individuals that you're observing, and you say, wow, they have more capacity to do whatever they want, then they potentially have more capacity to hurt me, right? The structural constraint declines, the individual perceives greater potential harm from other people seeking to achieve their interests. That doesn't necessarily mean they're going to harm me, but they could harm me. Now, for those of you, how many of you are international relations theorists or have any background in IR theory? This is anarchy, right? Okay, this end of the continuum. Here, weak structural constraint is what we in international relations theory would call anarchy. And as you know, anarchy produces all kinds of very peculiar behaviors in the state system that um, sometimes can lead to war. So here we have the, the full uh, um, state space labeled and everything. Uh, and uh, just very quickly, some terminology. Um, the dependent variable, which is identity, is called the behavior variable. Then there are two control variables, in this case, justice and structural constraint. They are the independent variables. The dependent variable is a joint function of the independent variables, these two independent variables, uh, justice and structural constraint. They are called the uh, control variables. Uh, the one at the back, uh, or the one here, this horizontal one, justice, uh, is called the normal factor. I'm not sure I'll use that term again. Uh, but the structural constraint, importantly, that varies from back to front, is called the splitting factor. It is the one responsible for splitting the surface. And the surface overall is called the response surface. Uh, notice that with this cusp here, and this is the best I could do in Word. I want some better software. And all those are laughs by Apple folks, I know. Um, so uh, this cusp here is important because there is a space between here and here, between the edge of this cusp and here. Um, actually, to be precise, between here and the edge of this cusp here, where you have uh, values of uh, identity that are unavailable for certain values of structural constraint. I'll explain that a little bit more in a moment. So let's go through some of these hypotheses. I just want to show you what I'm going to do now. I'm going to take each of the points at which, each of the sides at which the response surface intersects with the sides of the cube and explain why I have positioned these, um, these curves way, the way I have. And this is based on my understanding of conflict phenomena. Okay, so I, again, I have not come to this with a set of equations. Instead, what I've done is I've kind of mapped the, the surface, and then we can figure out the equations afterwards, which I'm sure people who do this stuff for a living would think is entirely backwards. Um, so uh, here we have a situation where we have uh, identity varying uh, at, with changes in justice under uh, a maximum structural constraint. So this is essentially zero latitude for agency. That's right at the back of the cube, right here. Uh, so we're holding structural constraint uh, at an extreme value. And I'm suggesting here that in those circumstances, as justice, perceived justice declines, as people think that their situation is increasingly unfair, uh, it doesn't actually affect their perception of identity. They don't, uh, they don't start feeling really bad about an outgroup because they can't actually attribute any of the, it's not me. They can't actually attribute any of the injustice uh, to, to a group or an individual because there's no uh, latitude for agency in the system. This is actually an unusual social circumstance. So it's kind of a thought experiment. But you can't blame people for things that they can't have reasonably done. So there are many circumstances where we think something is unfair, but we don't actually unblame them. We don't actually hold them, pe certain people responsible. We don't blame 
people for them. I'm going to blame you for that. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, an example would be, for instance, you, you, when, when people get cancer, they often would say, this is profoundly unfair. But they don't hold anybody in particular usually responsible for getting cancer. So in this situation, we don't see variation in identity with change in justice. But let's go to the front of the cube and have maximally weak structural constraint. And I would argue that we're looking at a, a situation like this. And this is where the model starts to, I think, develop some potency. Um, we have a situation where as justice starts to decline here, at a certain point, uh, a person's psychological state falls off the cusp and uh, you get a dramatic change in their perception of the outgroup and a move to much closer to the exclusive antagonistic end of the continuum. Um, I'm not going to go immediately into why that's the case, why structural constraint has the splitting effect. I'll come to that in a moment. I just want to emphasize, now remember, any point on the surface represents the psychological state of an individual, the individual in question. And what's happening here, they're at the front of this cube, so they're right over here, and they're moving in this direction right there. What's happening is that, is that the, uh, what it was a really good situation is starting to deteriorate, and some things that the person regards as unfair are starting to happen. And as they move towards that cusp, they start scanning their environment for folks or groups to blame. And they can potentially now hold somebody responsible because there's very weak structural constraint in the system. They can, <coughs> they can attribute responsibility at this point very easily to somebody because they perceive other people out and other groups in the, in the population as having uh, the capacity to do them harm, not being structurally constrained and having the capacity to do them harm. So this is what I mean by catastrophic dehumanization, falling off this cusp and, and, and having a, a sudden shift from this psychological state I1 to psychological state I2. Uh, notably, in this kind of model, you exhibit hysteresis, which means getting back to where you were. It takes you on a different route from the one that you used to get to where you are. So you fell off the cusp here and came down here and then maybe migrated. And then to get back up to this part of the surface, the response surface up here, you have to uh, go beyond the point that brought you down, which was J1 to J2, and then finally you pop back up to the higher part of the response surface. Uh, and this is something that is intuitively true of conflicts, that it's often much harder to get people back to peace than it was originally to get them into war. There are, there's a kind of stickiness to conflict situations that make them often very intractable. Now, I want to talk about what happens at this point as we move uh, from the back to the front uh, in terms of uh, declining structural constraint and why I believe uh, we have a, a widening of this gap as you move from this point, which is called the singularity to here. I'm going to do that by talking about uh, this hypothesis on that wall of the cube and this hypothesis. But first of all, I want you to imagine that you can take this like a loaf of bread, this cube, and slice it like that. And, uh, uh, and each slice represents a, a, the intersection of that slice with the response surface for a particular value of structural constraint. And I've taken a slice here. Just as we move from this back side of the cube to the front side of the cube, I've taken the slice just about here, just about where that singularity appears, right? So it's just the point at which the two planes start to diverge. So what's happening there? Well, I would argue that this is the first place, as structural constraint weakens, that it becomes possible for the individual to perceive that there is a group out there that can be held responsible for the unfairness that they see around them. So it's at that point, at that point, from here to here, they don't think there's enough uh, latitude for agency in the system that can actually hold anybody responsible. Beyond this point, though, they start to see that it's possible to hold somebody responsible for, for the unfairness that they see around them. And as structural constraint weakens more and more, uh, they get angrier and angrier about that unfairness because they can attribute more and more of that unfairness to the individual in question or to the population or the group in question. So that's one reason for 
I have more complex reasons for the widening of uh, the space between the two cusps. Here you see that it's, it's very tight. There's not much of a space, but as you get out here, you've got a, a big space between the two cusps, vertical space. So let's look uh, at this particular hypothesis here. Now, my argument is, and again, I'd like to credit Manana for this, that, that as if, if you really have a situation where people regard their situation as, an, as, as really just and fair, and they're being treated well, then as structural dis constraint declines and they still continue to perceive themselves as being treated fairly, uh, they will attribute, because they're now attributing a lot of responsibility to the folks around them because structural constraint has declined, they will attribute uh, that fairness to those folks. And that will have the effect of building trust and social capital uh, within the community rather than undermining it. So you can imagine that when, when you're at the extreme justice end of this continuum down here, that as you, which is where we are here because we're on the right-hand side of the cube, right, with this one, that as you weaken structural constraint, people actually start to feel better about their but the other members of the population not more antagonistically towards them. And this is gets, it's starting to look like a fairly complicated surface, right? But you'll notice, too, that you get a narrowing. Of, this is what I call the peace plane up here. You get a narrowing of this peace plane in the hor horizontally. It's, it's the peace plane extends from this cusp here all the way to the side, but here it extends from about here to the side, so it's narrowing. And that's because... As structural constraint weakens in the system, you're willing to credit people with good things if there's lots of good things happening. But because uh, they can potentially harm you a lot if they're not uh, trustworthy, then you become much less tolerant of the injustice. And so you drop off that cusp a lot faster at the front of the cube than you would farther back in the cube. So what about on the other side, this side? Uh, so here we have maximally, um, maximally low justice or highest injustice in the system. We have uh, a situation of moving from strong to weak structural constraint. I suggest that identity in this case drops off very fast. So you've got a situation where people are feeling really un that they're being treated really unfairly. And as soon as they have an opportunity to blame others for their circumstance, uh, then identity starts... It, it, uh, inclusive identity starts to collapse right away. So they drop very fast. Again, a hypothesis needs to be empirically tested and examined, but there's absolutely no reason why it couldn't be. And that accounts for this uh, essentially exponential decay that we have here towards the bottom of the cube. Okay. So now let's talk about um, why the cusp is where it is. So that's the fifth of the hypotheses. I've done the four hypotheses with the response surface intersecting the sides. Let's talk about the fifth, <clears throat> which is the most important part. Why a cusp? Why is it there? What are my arguments for it? I have this intuition uh, that when you put these three variables together in this way, that it describes a catastrophe, uh, a catastrophe response surface. Um, but unpacking that intuition in a way that makes, makes the argument legible and and cogent is another, another story. Um, I have two ways of doing this. Uh, and I'm going to show you, uh, given the time, I'm going to show you one. There's another way, too, which I'll allude to, but I won't actually show it to you unless people ask about it. Um, but first of all, uh, here we have a situation where we're, say, uh, cutting the cube, and that's that loaf of bread, about halfway between the singularity and the front of the cube, so somewhere around there. We're cutting the cube right there. Uh, and just to explain what we're looking at here, again, it's a slice across the cube. What happens, I've already discussed this, what happens as uh, the individual psychological state moves from J3 to J4? This is a situation where uh, the perceived injustice in their circumstances is changing. Things seem to be unfair to them. And as they move down the cusp, they start scanning their environment for people and potentially groups to blame. But they, they scan, but they don't necessarily develop immediately an antagonistic attitude towards them. But they're saying, basically, what's happening to me here? You can imagine an economic crisis. What's happening to me here? What, uh, uh, why have I lost my job? 
why my family members suddenly started suffering so much. Uh, who's responsible for this? Right? Um, and what happens at this cusp is uh, a situation where they identify who's responsible, they've identified who's responsible, and they develop a decisive, antagonistic uh, attitude towards them. Split the group into two, we, they, and those guys are my enemy, and they're dangerous to me, and perhaps ultimately they need to be destroyed. Um, uh, so what's happening at the cusp? And here's where I try to unpack this using essentially rational choice logic, the rationality at the cusp, I call it. And uh, as I say, this is one way of doing it. I'm not actually convinced that this is the best way, but here's what I do. Let me go back before I show that mess. Um, so, so you're, yeah, it should be about five minutes to be about right. So you're at this cusp, and uh, you've identified uh, groups, another group of people, say a they, provisionally, um, but you haven't made the decision essentially, and it might be a subliminal, almost emotional decision, but you haven't come to the conclusion that they are, uh, um, that they should be uh, dehumanized. You haven't dehumanized them. You haven't developed an antagonistic attitude towards them. Uh, but you are, in a sense, evaluating whether that identified group is trustworthy or untrustworthy. And there's a kind of expected value calculation going on in your head. What's the risk of trusting them? What's the risk of not trusting them? And my argument is essentially that what happens at the cusp is that the risk of trusting them is suddenly outweighed by the risk of untrusting them. And it's a, it's a binary state. You get a flip at that point. So let's walk through that. Is it expected value calculations? For those of you who've done any economics, you've seen this kind of thing. I think I got it right. Uh, the individual has a choice to uh, trust the identified group or distrust the identified group. Uh, then the expected value of that decision to trust here is uh, the sum of these two uh, product terms here. And uh, the expected value of the decision to distrust the identified group is the sum of these two product terms here. Uh, there are um, eight significant costs and benefits, as you can see. First of all, you have here the estimated probability the group is actually trustworthy, the estimated probability the group is actually untrustworthy, and here you have uh, eight costs. Now, the expected value calculation always involves a probability times an estimate of cost and benefit, just for those of you who are not economists. And, uh, uh, and uh, so you can kind of unpack the decision-making process by looking at factors that influence both the estimation the estimate of trustworthiness versus untrustworthiness, and factors that influence uh, various estimates of benefit and cost. And notice that this is changing. Here you have the benefit from trusting a group that's actually trustworthy, plus the cost of trusting a group that's actually trustworthy. Here you have the benefit from trusting a group that's actually untrustworthy, the cost of trusting a group that's actually untrustworthy. This seems really pedantic, but this is the logic behind an expected value calculation. Now I would argue, and I'm not going to go into detail, that um, the asterisk costs and benefits here can probably, a uh, first order approximation, be treated as zero. Uh, so um, the cost of trusting a group that's actually trustworthy, you could probably safely say, as I say, at a first order approximation, that that's zero. The cost of trusting, the benefit of trusting a group that's actually untrustworthy, probably safe to say, first order, that it's zero. So you can actually discount those factors right away. I'd also make an argument that both A and D here can be, um, D right there, uh, can be discounted. Um, that and essentially they can be treated as almost equivalent and I won't get into exactly why that's the case. And then finally that means that uh, two sets of costs turn out to be particularly important, B and C. The cost of trusting a group that's actually untrustworthy, the cost of distrusting a group that's actually uh, trustworthy, excuse me, I made a mistake, the cost of trusting a group that's actually untrustworthy and the cost of distrusting a group that's actually trustworthy. Now for those of you who have done any statistics, you're seeing type 1 and type 2 error, right? right? And my argument essentially is that as folks move towards this cusp, the risk of type 2 error in their minds starts to outweigh type 1 error and they flip at that point, right? 
uh, so the cost, of, just to put that in lay terms, the cost of distrusting a group that's actually trustworthy, which is a type one error, uh, is outweighed by the cost of trusting a group that's actually untrustworthy. You're more worried about having these guys inside your group and being untrustworthy and being dangerous to you than uh, excluding, excluding people who are otherwise trustworthy from your group and perhaps losing whatever social capital or, or connection you have with them. It's more dangerous to have them inside and untrustworthy. It's more greater cost to you to have them inside and untrustworthy to, than to exclude them if they're trustworthy. Um, and there are reasons why I think that's actually the kind of logic that happens, this kind of uh, uh, mini-max logic, minimizing, minimizing maximum cost logic that people talk about in game theory that actually works in many of these conflict situations. OK, last slide. What happens when you go, when you drop off this top of the response surface down here? I call this the peace plane, but you end up down here in the war plane. Uh, I actually think you're in the land of fear at that point. And fear is incredibly destructive when it, in this kind of environment. It actually, you start to develop feedback loops and I've identified what I think might be happening. Uh, once you're on the war plane, so remember you're on that lower surface, declining structural constraint is inducing fear. As you come towards the front of the cube, you're getting more and more scared because you've identified these people now as a threat to you. You're getting more and more scared the fear accentuates the percep perception of injustice. Why am I afraid of these people? I shouldn't be afraid of them. I'm good. They must be bad. Very simple psychologic that is extremely prevalent in conflict. They're threatening to me. I'm good. They shouldn't be threatening me because I'm good. Therefore, they're bad. Uh, so it, it accentuates the perception that that group is unjust. Fear and the perception of injustice combine to cause anger. And just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about, <sighs> That's the other way of doing it. Uh, <clears throat> when you're on the war plane, coming in this direction to the front of the cube, the cube accentuates fear, accentuates fear, and coming in this direction toward this bottom corner, the combination of the sense of injustice and declining structural constraint accentuates anger. That's a very powerful combination. Uh, and then finally, both fear and anger become further evidence in the individual's mind of declining stu structural constraint and the outgroup's rising threat. Uh, feedback loops. And so what that does is it drags you down to the bottom corner of this box, and you get stuck there in a trap. Um, and it can be very hard to get out. And how do you fix this kind of situation? Usually what has to be done is you have to bring in something equivalent to a Hobbesian Leviathan, and you have to separate the parties, as you did in Sarajevo. And you have to say, OK, stop it, boys. Stop slaughtering each other. Cool down. And what you're doing, what are you doing? Is you're reducing, uh, uh, <coughs> you're increasing structural constraint. You're reducing latitude for agency. And that has the consequence of, if you do it severely enough, of dragging them back and up eventually onto this peace plane. And that's it.